So again, if you haven't, please help yourself to uh, pizza before we get going. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Ian Grant. I'm the director of the Entrepreneurship Center, known as the E-Center. Uh, so we're really excited today. This is our first event of the spring semester. Uh, and as we did last fall, one of the things we know is really important is that it all starts with ideas. Right? So we have all sorts of other programming aspects, but uh, trying to define and refine how do you see a problem, how do you start to create ideas and solutions for things, uh, we realize that that's probably the first place that's good for students to, to, to start. So you know, some of you I know, and you're all at different places with ideas, and, and uh, you know, some going forward. But you know, whether it's for your own personal standpoint, obviously Holloway competition's coming up, uh, social venture was in the fall, or social ventures next fall, how, depending upon how far you plan ahead. So uh, really excited uh, to have uh, James Trilligator uh, come. For, he's at, at Tufts. Uh, he does design thinking, right? So design thinking's, you know, a newfangled way to say idea creation. Uh, has more aspects to it, which he's far more articulate and uh, ed educated on it than I am. Um, but really look forward to this. So again, this is a two-part. So today, uh, and he'll go over sort of the itinerary, but we have this afternoon session. Uh, and then you get a break and, and be thinking about some of the things you've learned and then come back and the afternoon's gonna be significantly more of the boot camp, roll up your sleeves, start to really create stuff. Uh, and we'll have a different meal plan, so it's pizza for lunch. Uh, and then we'll have different uh, dinner for tonight. So hopefully you all can make it back and there should be some more this afternoon as well. So James. Thanks, thanks. All right, so welcome everyone. If you didn't find the little name tags, just help yourself to one. They're horribly colored, but they help me. I just realized the Sharpies don't work too well, so sorry about that. Uh, all right, so uh, let's see. I thought I would begin by answering probably a question that's on your mind. If you read about my history and stuff, you know that sort of my background is in psychology. So you may be wondering, you know, what can a psychologist really have to say about design? But I wanted to say that I'm not that kind of a psychologist, right? So I don't know anything about clinical psychology. I can't help you with problems. I don't know anything about that. I thought it would be, be useful to hear a little bit about my background just so you know where I'm coming from. I sort of started off my life uh, in computer science, did then wandered into philosophy and psychology. Uh, and ended up finishing my undergraduate degree with a double degree in philosophy and psychology. And then I went off and pursued the psychology side of things. Uh, and I did most of my PhD work in visual perception, attention, neuroscience, cognition, things like that. Quick postdoc in neurology. And then I spent about four years running think tanks and innovation centers for VC firms. I was director of strategic innovation for one big company and stuff like that. And then for the last, well, for the last year and a half, I've been in Boston at Tufts. But Previous to that, for 13 years, I was in the UK, where I was doing uh, consumer psychology and innovation, whatever that means. Uh, and I thought I would just tell you a little bit about kind of consumer psychology, what it's all about. It's really, it's a fun area because it's about understanding how people hear about things, choose things, buy things, use things, and ultimately dispose of stuff. And I like to use the word stuff just because it really could be anything. So some of the stuff that I look at is sort of internal experiences. How do people experience a space? Some of it's around advertising. Did a lot of work on supermarkets for evil companies trying to engineer their supermarkets to get you to buy more. It's quite interesting, actually. Uh, a lot of work on branding, internet stuff. Uh, I spent a lot of time on packaging as well. When you think about it, if you have a new product, the package is really kind of the first experience that anyone has of your product. So it's an interesting kind of psychological game to play there. And of course, things like smartphones, wearables, apps, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so today, what I'm going to be doing is taking you through sort of design thinking. And for the first maybe half hour or so, I'm going to talk a bit about the history of design thinking. Not too much. I'm not going to do too much lecturing. Uh, but I thought it would be good to just get a quick sense from everyone in here, sort of, you know, why you're here, what your name is, what your majors or interests are. Uh, partly this is just because I feel like I should get to know the room a bit, but also because I want to start to think about what spaces we might want to ideate in, right? So you have to do design thinking in a domain, and we have to begin at some point this afternoon to identify what domain we want to think about. So if we could just go around like sort of literally 30 seconds each, maybe just your name, some of these kinds of things, you can sort of skip whatever you don't want to talk about. I guess we'll start with Nicholas. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm from Argentina. Nice. Yeah, I'm doing a major in economics. I'm here for an exchange. Well, when I hear about this, this course, this bootcamp, well, it was really interesting on well, learning the basics about design thinking. Mm -hmm. I think this is a nice to do. And in terms of your future, any sense what kind of design thinking you might want to do? Are you going into banking or what Consumer space? Goods. Consumer goods. Okay, great, great. Theo. Um, ah, wow, a mic to pass around. <laughs> Fancy. <coughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> um, I'm Theo, I'm electrical engineer, and my interests are um, HCI, human computer interfaces. Mm. Um, I don't really know what I'm hoping to learn today, I just kind of came to see what I can get out of nice. it. Cool, sounds good, awesome. I guess we'll pass it over to, I can't. Chasia. Chasia. Yes. Chasia. <laughs> um, I'm Chasia, I'm a marketing and entrepreneurial studies major. Um, and I just kind of came, I know nothing about design thinking, so. Nice. Sounds good. In terms of your future, anything thought where you might want to go with all that? Like I don't consumer know. good? No idea. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Next up. Um, I'm Jessica, Jessica, marketing and entrepreneurship uh, major, and hopefully in the future, own my own business. Cool. Hi, my name's Anupri. Um, I'm thinking international business, mm -hmm. and I want to help companies like with merging and creating things so globalization is a little bit easier. Cool on the inside of the businesses there. Oh, nice. All right, I guess move over here to em Emma. Emma. <laughs> um, Emma. Hi, my name is Emma. I'm a social work and women's studies major interested in prison reform and equitable access to education. So I don't know what I'm doing here. No, that's I actually important. work at the Center for Social Innovation. So I'm hoping that I'll just learn more that I can apply mm. to helping people understand what human-centered design and social innovation is. Awesome. Yeah, a lot of my past students have gone into social enterprises, social entrepreneurship. It's a great area, so we'll see if we can work some in. Um, I'm Eli, major, um, business administration, still open. Uh, future goals, pretty much just helping people through uh, hopefully an organization of some kind that either I started myself or I decided to work with. And what I'm hoping to learn today is just kind of... Yeah, the basics of design thinking and like more of creating like an action plan for stuff that you want to follow through with. Cool, sounds great. Next up. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Rachel. I'm studying business administration with a concentration in international business and economics. A um, little fuzzy on future goals, but uh, <laughs> I want to, I think, ultimately work with an international organization that's mm. focused on solving social issues. Um, maybe Oxfam, UN, that type of nice. thing. And I am hoping to just learn more about design thinking. We've had some introductions at it. I also work at the Center for Social Innovation and Enterprise. Mm. So we've had some introduction to it, but learning how to um, analyze problems better. Sounds good. Yeah. Great, thanks. Dave. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is David. I am an MBA candidate here. Hmm. And so I'm just looking to uh, learn something about uh, entrepreneurship and yeah. Any thought, what kind of MBA are you? Entrepreneurship, banking, business, is there a domain you're interested in? Focusing on um, marketing. Marketing, yeah. okay, cool. Oh, oh I can sorry. take it over, sure, thanks. All right, sorry, we're starting to get a space. So as, as we're going around, by the way, everyone should be also maybe starting to think about, are there interesting shared spaces that we could focus on? Like there's some interest here in social Development, social enterprise, making a difference, prison reform. We'll see if we can sort that all out today. <laughs> all right, Dylan. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dylan Wheeler. I'm a sophomore information technology student, um, and I'm really interested in developing software. Uh, and I think you know it'd be fun to one day um, you know have my own little software company and and try to you know develop some sort of app or, or some type of platform that that helps people. Cool. You all set up here. All right, uh, so I'm Ben Daniels. I'm planning on majoring in finance and entrepreneurial studies. And some of my future goals entail like uh, either venture capital or angel investing. Um, and in terms of today, I'm just hoping to get at least one thing out of it and I'll be happy. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks. Hi, I'm Nam Louis. Um, I'm an accounting major. And I hope in the future I can open a accounting firms in my countries. And I hope I, I can learn something creative thinking from this class. Hmm. Sounds good. Hi, I'm Catherine Peebles. I'm from uh, the College of Liberal Arts. I coordinate the humanities program there, and I direct the Master of Arts in Liberal Studies. Hmm. And my colleagues and I are increasingly interested in design thinking as a practice and a discourse, specifically um, using it um, pedagogically to teach very, very um, humanistic types of things like close reading and um, analytical skills related to close reading and interpretation with respect to you know, writing an essay or solving uh, a problem of interpretation. So it's kind of a 
a repackaging yeah, of yeah. age-old questions to us, but I think in a really useful way, and we're just trying to learn more about it. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Sierra. I'm a marketing major. And uh, for the future, I really want to go into TV publications hmm. for brand promoting and um, just product branding. Excellent. Sounds good. Hi, I'm Jordan. I'm education major. Hmm. I'm, I've never been to any of these things before, <laughs> so I'm just really Welcome. here to figure it out. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. I'm Zach. I'm a finance major. Uh, future goals maybe working in private equity or Wall Street and then hopefully maybe start my own business sometime. Nice. All right. I am Christian Comer, computer science major, and I want to create a software product that will help a lot of people in a really small way. Just make a lot of people's lives a little bit better. Mm, cool. I'm Francesco, um, sophomore computer science major and I plan on going into machine learning in the future, potentially, and as Dylan, definitely opening my own software company would be a dream. Nice, that's great, all right, wow. Very interesting, so we have some, some coherence, some kind of different ideas, uh, some interesting spaces to start thinking about. I'm hoping that as we work through a couple of activities over the next hour or so, we can start to find your own little tribe or your own little group. Uh, and it raises one interesting question, which is often, the best design thinking happens if you have sort of interdisciplinary teams. So it depends how we want to think about it, but we could, for instance, break everyone up into, you know, these people want to do software stuff, these people want to do social enterprise, social change, finance, etc. Or we could try to take a, one from each of those domains and mix them together and come up with killer radical ideas. So we'll see how things evolve. I wanted to just begin with a little example. Uh, from design thinking, of design thinking. Uh, this is the Keep the Change program that uh, IDEO developed with Bank of America. Raise your hand if you've heard of this program. I'm just curious. Not very many of you. It's funny because, well, you'll see that they claim it's incredibly successful, but I've presented it many times and no one's ever heard of it. So I don't know how successful it can really be. But anyway, see what you think. It's a great example of design thinking and how it can kind of make a difference. It's a little loud and cheesy, too. At Bank of America, we recognize that innovative banking products are the key to attracting new customers. That's why we recently launched Keep the Change, a unique program that helps customers put aside savings on a regular basis. Here's how it works. Under the Keep the Change program, every debit card purchase made by a participating customer is automatically rounded up to the next dollar. The difference is then transferred to the customer's savings account. Every debit card purchase adds to the total. To provide added incentive for new accounts, the bank matches 100% of program deposits for the first three months, and 5% thereafter, up to $250 per year. Bank of America's Keep the Change program was launched in October 2005, and has already proven an overwhelming success. By January of 2006, the program has attracted more than 1 million customers, and more than 20% of these customers were new to the bank. Imagine. A program that attracts 200,000 new customers in just three months. That's the power of innovation. The power of innovation. So it's a bit cheesy, but it's pretty, it's a cute idea. I mean, it's pretty clear how it works. Basically, if you make any purchase, it rounds up your purchase, and then it takes that little extra bit that it's rounded up and puts it in your savings account. And it's great because it really does sort of address one of the real societal problems now. People don't have any money saved up for retirement for the future, etc. So it's kind of a clever idea. They developed it based on kind of working with IDEO. In fact, here's what IDEO says about it. You know, they, they talk about how they realized when they understood how people spend money, you know, you go out and you buy stuff, you usually think about it as if it were rounded up anyway. And so they kind of took that little subtle insight into human behavior and, and wrapped a program around it. And that's kind of a big part of what design thinking is, is understanding how people, customers, consumers, just ordinary uh, individuals live their life and identifying a little opportunity to make it better and then doing something with that identification. And we'll go through it today uh, in every minute 
detail. So we'll see what it's all about. Uh, and oh yeah, so it's basically about understanding your customers, having some empathy for how they live their life, how they spend their time, what their pains are, what their dreams and aspirations are, and kind of you know understanding their desires and then actually making a change. Now, and this, the point here is quite interesting that it's not really, it didn't require a massive investment on the part of Bank of America, right? So it's pretty easy to set up the software to do that. It's kind of all there. I mean, it's not that easy, but um, it wasn't like they had to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to acquire all these new customers. So from a company perspective, it's also a, a great way to identify a small change that can make a big impact on your bottom line, if that's what you care about, or on societal change, if that's what you care about. Uh, and so today what we're going to do is it's going to be a lot of discussions. I'm going to have you guys discussing things with each other. I may at some point ask, for instance, the two people at the back to come and join the two people at the front, just so we have sort of four at each table. Uh, so yeah, we're going to do a lot of that. And really, the only way to get good at design thinking is by doing it. So a lot of today, I'm hoping 80% of the time will be spent working on design thinking in your little groups. I'm kind of here just as comic relief and to shepherd you along a bit. Uh, so get ready to do stuff. There's Play-Doh there, so you can feel free to play around. Yeah, so there's going to be lots of activities. Uh, the other side of it is that I'm going to use examples from lots of different domains, lots of different sort of mechanisms for design thinking or for behavior change. Uh, I'll explain more about that later. So it, some of it might seem irrelevant. Actually, conveniently, I have a lot of banking and finance examples. Uh, I've done a lot of work sort of with large banks on d bringing design thinking into banking. It's one of the big areas nowadays in the world. Uh, I've also done a lot of work in education using design thinking, things like that. So it's going to get messy. There's going to be hundreds of post-its. I put a couple of stacks, but I have hundreds more post-its here. So there'll be post-it storms on every table, so that's fine. Uh, and it's going to seem a little random at some point, but just trust the process. Some things are going to seem stupid and why am I doing this? And that's fine, I agree, some of it is stupid and why are you doing it? But uh, at the end, I'm hoping it'll make sense. And so just kind of trust the process. But like I said before, I'm gonna begin with a quick little presentation of a journey towards design thinking. And this is, you have to forgive my sort of professor academic side of things, but it's kind of interesting, I think, and helps contextualize where design thinking comes from. So I'm gonna just say a little bit about it. Uh, and I guess if we're gonna begin almost analyzing design thinking, you have to think about, well, what is design? Uh, and here's a nice little definition from the UK. Um, design is what links creativity and innovation. It shapes ideas to become practical and attractive propositions for users or customers. Design is described as creativity deployed to a specific end, which is kind of a nice way of thinking about it. So it's like not an artist being creative, but it's still that same kind of creative innovation, creative energy that you're now applying to try to solve a problem. And I have a little example. It's kind of a silly example, but it's kind of cute nonetheless. It's uh, design thinking from 1893. Uh, and this is the guy with a quite impressive beard, Whitcomb Judson. There he is. Uh, and back in his day, 1893, everyone wore boots. And you had two choices of boots. Either you had boots that you have to buckle up, and that's kind of a pain because you have to do every buckle, or you have boots that you have to lace up, and when you want to take them off, you have to undo all the laces, a real pain as well. And he started thinking about this, and he kind of deployed his creativity, and he invented a little mechanism, a little machine that could do it for him, and that's the zipper. So good old Whitcomb, he got a patent on it. Uh, and it's a nice example where you have this one thing that bothers you in life, and you come up with an idea, a mechanism, a way to actually solve that problem. Uh, now, in his case, I don't really know the details of how he went from the concept to the solution, uh, but there is a belief, and I'd like to, I hope that today you'll see that it's a false belief, that it really requires a flash of insight, that the only way that you're gonna have a brilliant idea or an innovative idea is just in a moment of inspiration. And that does happen. Often people, as they're falling asleep, have brilliant ideas, etc. cetera. Uh, and often if you get away from a problem, you have a brilliant idea, et cetera. But there's other ways to get there. You can get there through a process, which is what design thinking is all about. And I'm going to begin this particular journey, because there's lots of journeys to understand design thinking, but I kind of like this one. This guy, uh, I'm sh I doubt anyone knows who this is. Again, I've presented this many times and no one's ever identified him, but that's Christopher Alexander. Did anyone know about a curiosity? No. Yeah. Uh, he's not relevant at all in any way to this world, except he was uh, an interesting guy. He was a, an architect. He was an urban planner. He was kind of a, a big ideas philosopher and thinker. Uh, and back in the 1960s, he wrote a very influential book called Notes on the Synthesis of Form. Uh, and it's kind of a, a nice book because he, he took a very abstract view of what is design, like as an architect, as a designer, as an urban planner. And he has this lovely way of thinking about it uh, where basically 
the object of design, and in this case, he's really thinking of physical design, a building, a product, anything like that. So what you want to do if you're designing something is you want to come up with a form, some object. Who knows what it is? And he says that really every design problem is an effort to achieve fitness between the form and the context. Right? So like that is the perfect solution. That could be the ideal design for that particular set of constraints. So it's really about taking constraints and coming up with an innovation that can address those constraints. And he says, you know, the form is the part of the world over which we have control, which we decide to shape while leaving the rest of the world as it is. The context is that part of the world which puts demands on the form. So the, these could be two different design spheroids. Uh, and both of them could be like the ultimate god design of meeting that particular context. So it's really about form and context. Uh, and so that's kind of what it's about, is understanding what kind of form can I make that will address this context or these contextual constraints? So what I wanted to do is actually just have you guys spend a couple minutes thinking at your tables about, let's say we had to come up with a new design for something. And you could feel free, I have some things, some new shoes, a smartphone app, a subway system, an inhaler for kids, a desk chair, an uh, artificial defibrillator thing, robot lawnmower. Do they have robot lawnmowers yet? That's one I came up with, it'd be cool. They do, they probably do. Yeah. Anyway, let's say you, had that, you wanted to design the perfect version of one of those things. I just want you to chat in your group about what kinds of constraints do you need to think about as you're doing that design, as you're trying to come up with the best version of any of those things. So each table randomly or as a group, pick up one of those. I'm only gonna give you five minutes to discuss it. So just a rapid fire, just come up with some examples and go. So remember, the idea is just pick one of these things or any other product and just come up with a list of some of the context variables that might inform that design. So whether it's a new app or a new, like, so let's say if I am doing shoes, context variables might be the size of the person's feet, they might be the material properties in the shoe, they might be the price point, there's all kinds of business constraints that are coming into play. So think about the broader set of constraints that might help you come up with a good design. All right, so wrap up your last thoughts. And I'm just curious to hear I guess we'll start with you guys. What was your what was your product and what were a few of the constraints? Well, we did the shoes. Shoes, nice. And some constraints for like price, uh -huh. um, to appeal to the target market and like creating a green business. Cool. Um, like location of sales, like e-commerce and whatnot, and then, like durability and comfort and appeal. Excellent. Sounds good. Oh, <laughs> just we're finished. Who's everything? I'll take it. Uh, okay, let's. I'll go to the front room. How about you guys? Yeah. <laughs> What was the product? Okay, we had an uh, inhaler for kids. Ah, nice. And we um, we brought down some issues like uh, pharmaceutical regulations, entry barriers, ethical issues, mm. maybe licenses, gathering the, the uh, a right team of people for manufacturing for the for the mm, manufacturer. Nice. Um, oh, good. Excellent. That sounds great. I just wanted a sense of the kinds of things. Good. All right. So I'm, it sounds like everyone did well. I've uh, checked in with a few of the other teams. There's some really good sense of what the constraints might be. Now, that's one way you could approach design. If you have already a product and you want to kind of make a small change, that's great. Then that's one thing you should do. And, you know, to Christopher Alexander's point, it's important to think about what constraints, what kind of context variables you're going to think about. And he worked through lots of examples in his books. One of the examples that he, he went through was a vacuum cleaner. So let's say you want to design a new vacuum cleaner. There, this is Jim Dice, James Dyson's first one. He actually went through almost 3,000 prototypes and versions before he came to the one that's on market which is amazing. And when Christopher Alexander worked through this 30, 40 years before Dyson came along, you know, he talked about all the things that you need to think about, the performance of the thing, how simple it is, you don't want too complex of a machine, the economy, the joints, how would you actually manufacture this thing? And, you know, it gets messy to actually come up with all the constraints that could help inform a final design, right? So the idea here is that you have constraints in a context that informs what ultimately is the best design. And yeah, that's tough, but he said, okay, yeah, that's tough, but consider the task if you have to design a complete environment for a million people, right? So if you have to design a new city, a new Boston or something like that, that's a pretty complicated design challenge, right? So 
he, he, Christopher Alexander, says, okay, so how can we do it? As a designer, what do we do? We just sit around waiting? Do we pray? Do we hope? Do we hope for some information? He says, no. The answer is a process. As long as you have a process, you'll be fine. He says it's kind of like solving a complex math problem. So here's a very complex math problem. As long as you have a simple set of rules, that's fine. You can look at any complicated problem, no matter if you're designing a city or just designing a new shoe. Uh, and as long as you have a process, you'll get there eventually. And he then actually went on to develop a process for designing urban centers and buildings. He developed something called a pattern language, which actually in some worlds, in some computer science spaces, he's kind of thought of as a hero. It was one of the first kind of almost object-oriented thinking where he has these basic patterns that could then be applied and multi-layered. Pretty cool stuff. And he came up with this set of uh, patterns that would work and he says each pattern is an arrangement of physical environments and he, here's some examples of his patterns. They're kind of pretty abstract in a sense. He had 253 different patterns and his work on using a process to design form is still actually used quite frequently. So here's an architectural firm that kind of talks a lot about his work and they talk about how you go out in the world and you start to sense sort of initial discovery. You look for beginning patterns and you take those and you structure them through things. And here's some examples, you know, the buildings that they build are always very gorgeous and they fit into their environment. They're really aimed at creating a harmony between the context and the form. Uh, and that's really in Alexander's view what it's all about is taking this set of contextual constraints and using them to inform a form. And that, in a weird way, is kind of the roots of design thinking, and I'll show you in a second what that means, but I want to first show you one other little example of design thinking, and this one's more kind of practical, more applied. It's the lucky iron fish. Raise if you've heard of this example. No, oh, this is a lovely little example. I think you'll enjoy this one. Do, do, do. If I can get it to play. Yay. first moved to Cambodia, I lived in a rural village and it took a little bit of time before people got used to this sort of foreigner wandering around. Initially, I was here to search for a remedy to a problem. Anemia, caused by a lack of iron in the blood. It causes dizziness and weakness. It breeds complacency and lethargy. Kids can't concentrate in school. It also causes premature births and problems during pregnancy for women. Nearly two out of three children are anemic. But this piece of metal has the power to stop it all. My challenge was to find a way to supplement the typical Cambodian diet of fish and rice. I knew that iron pills and other iron treatments weren't really affordable by many people in the villages. In my search, I found that cooking in a cast iron pot can release iron into the food and that iron has been absorbed in the diet. But I realized that most Cambodian women use aluminum pots because they're cheaper and lighter. And then I got to thinking, what if I could get them to put this chunk of iron in their pot? It would be a simple, cheap, and accessible treatment that even the remote villagers could use. But my simple solution had one big problem found that the women were hesitant to add this sort of ugly piece of iron into their pots. I found that the iron blocks came in very useful, but just not in the pots. And so I realized I had to dig a little bit deeper. I searched for everything. I looked at sayings and beliefs. I looked at rituals. Anything that would give me a better understanding of Cambodian culture. And then I landed this. A symbol of good luck. I um, was a little bit shocked when I when I found out how uh, positive the findings were. In the test areas, anemia has pretty much disappeared altogether, which is absolutely astounding. It's, it was far exceeded what we had expected. We're hoping that this little fish holds the key to treating anemia across the region and beyond. It's definitely one lucky fish. Pretty cool project, isn't it? I mean, and, and it's a nice example of how you can go into an area and understand sort of the problem, understand the lifestyle, understand the contextual constraints, and then use all of that information to kind of design an ideal form. So it really is about kind of taking this, uh, understanding the context and coming up with a form to meet it. 
Uh, and it's important also to think about not just form in the literal sense, but also more broadly, right? So if you're making a business, part of the form is going to be the, the kind of the value proposition to the consumers, the branding, the marketing, the advertising, the customer service, all of that is part of the form in the end. That's the final product. It's not necessarily the physical thing. Uh, we'll get back to that a bit later. So yeah, design problems always begin by understanding that, by trying to achieve this harmony, but it always happens within some kind of specific domain or some specific kind of context. So for example, you could be doing design thinking in architecture like Christopher Alexander did, or you could be doing it for product developments like the Lucky Iron Fish, for instance. You could be designing machines if you're a mechanical engineer, or if you're kind of building new stuff. Uh, electrical engineer, if you could be designing new businesses, you know, or you could be designing new services. Service offerings are great. Uh, health interventions, these are all places where design thinking has sort of been applied. The other one that's worth thinking about is designing new experiences. There's this whole movement towards the experience economy. Currently, tourism globally is the largest employer, so a lot of you, ultimately, statistically, may end up working sort of in or related to travel, tourism, etc. And there it's about understanding the experiences that you want to design. So you can, again, apply the same kind of thinking in, into that space as well. I have educational programs. That's one of the places where I apply design thinking. And in all those cases, it's really the same kind of process. You have to do some research, understand the constraints that are there, understand who the users are, what kind of scenarios they go through, how they live their life use some empathy to understand them, bring in other people from other disciplines, and from all of that you can kind of start to design some forms. And even when you have a form, you want to not think of it as the final form, but you want to build a prototype, understand its function, how it works in the space, in the broader space, etc. So if you think about all of these different spaces and ways of applying this kind of abstract thinking, you can come up with what design thinking really is. If you abstract away from all those different domains, you come up with kind of design thinking. So for example, uh, going back to the lucky iron fish, you begin by identifying a specific problem and getting at the root of it. You understand the, co the context, in this case it's sort of the consumer, understand how they live their life, how they spend their time. Once you've begun to understand the context, you then can create a form. Usually it's kind of a prototype, a first draft, maybe a paper prototype or a mock-up. And you go out and you try it out, you have people evaluate it, uh, and you see if it works out in that context, and then you iterate. You kind of create the next version that's a little bit closer to what you want. And that's kind of what design thinking is all about. And that's what we're going to do today, is go through that process. And it's actually, well, the last bit of history, the last bit of lectury part is, I just want to show you that, so, you know, if you go back to sort of the 1960s, which is when Christopher Alexander was doing his work, there's sort of participatory design, design science, design methods. A lot of people started doing work in that space in the 60s. And then once you hit the 1980s, when you get to sort of the beginning of computer stuff, you have people like Don Norman doing user-centered design. Then it became, you know, they were building electronic devices or electronic interfaces where it's much more important to start thinking about who the end user is. And so Don Norman kind of championed this, the psychology of everyday things or later named the design of everyday things. And he's the one who then went off to Apple and kind of founded their ethos around user-centered design. Um, and then it carries on through to the 1990s, 2000s. And this basically right now, I always think, I always feel a bit guilty saying that I'm doing design thinking because it's just the latest name for this method of iteratively user-centered design. But that's what we're going to do today. And there's lots of different ways that people kind of follow the design thinking process. So this is one of the ones from uh, Stanford D School. You understand who you're kind of solving for, understand kind of how they live their life, what their needs are. You understand how you might solve their problem. You build a rough prototype. You test it. You maybe use a little story to explain it to people. And then you start again. You empathize again. So that's one way. There's other ways as well. Uh, you know, this is a kind of a random collection of them. In general, they're all about starting at the beginning to kind of broadly discover what's out there. How do people live their life? What kind of pains do they have? Then you want to kind of come up with some definition. You want to develop a concept and go out and test it and iteratively refine it. So these are all the different ways uh, that various people have done it. And I have my own. Everyone, you know, every academic has to have their own little model. This is mine, the climber model. Uh, it's a nice model. It's kind of over the last year or so I've been developing it more. I've been working in this space for 10 years. The main thing I like about it, I have to admit, is just that it, it has an acronym. So all the other models, you know, there's like the ideates, the brains, there's, there's random names, and you can never keep them straight. Mine, at least, if you just remember Climber, you can go through the whole design thinking process. It sounds stupid, but it actually makes life much easier. So that's what we're going to do today, is we're going to go through each of those different steps. 
And as long as you go through it again, it's basically what we've been saying. You start by understanding who your customer is, identify them very specifically, understand how they live their life, what are their pains, problems, dreams, aspirations. You identify a possibility, and I've kept that intentionally vague. Sometimes it's a way to make their life better. Other times it's a way to make it less bad. Uh, you come up with a mechanism. Again, that's kind of intentionally vague because in some cases that might be a new product. In other cases, it might be a new law. In other cases, it might be an ad campaign. I have examples of all these different things later that you'll see. You build a rough draft, you evaluate it, and you repeat. So that's basically what we're going to go through today, is that process, the climber process. And if you go through that, you're doing design thinking, and you're pretty much guaranteed to come up with some cool new stuff or at least have fun. So that's my hope for today is we're going to do new stuff or have fun. So, we're going to have to begin with customers. Now, usually when I run this for uh, groups of students or groups at a company, they already have a customer roughly identified. So if it's a bank, they know that they want to appeal to new retirees or to new millennials. And so we start by talking about that. In your case, uh, you're all random people with lots of different interests. So this is what I was alluding to earlier. We have to think about who we're going to try to market our new things to or what kind of challenges we're going to try to address in society. Uh, etc. So we're going to begin by trying to identify our customers. Uh, and so yeah, actually I wanted to say, so we'll go through the entire model. We're going to start with customers uh, and basically you should always start with your customers. So this is actually basic marketing as well. You know, you always want to think whether you're doing a new design, whether you're going to do a new research project, if you're going to write a paper for your professor for instance, your professor is ultimately your customer. You have to always think about what your customer wants. So yeah, whether it's a new product, a new service, new rules or regulations, I've done work with the national banks and things like that, websites, all of those things, you need to understand who is actually going to be using that thing. So we have to begin by our customers and this is where it's going to get to be a bit of a challenge because we have to identify our customers. Uh, and I guess what we could do is, I, I think it might be easier if we put you guys in tables of shared interest, let's say. So maybe we'll begin just by coming up with some ideas for the kinds of people you might want to talk to, interact with, people who might be your customers. So whether it's um, you know, students, that's kind of an easy one. Whether it's specific types of students, we could get more or less specific. I guess we could write some possibilities up here. Does anyone have any either customer segments or cool technology or space you want to play in? Basically, we have to identify our playgrounds. And I want to come up with maybe six, maybe three. Any thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, I'll put third world communities. Any others? Oh, sorry, yes. <coughs> Men's prisons. Okay, uh, I'll say prisoners. I hope that's not politically incorrect or something, but <laughs> any other groups to appeal to? Uh, it could also be defined by how they live their life or what kind of technology, so smartphone owners, people thinking about banking. Are there other domains you want to talk about? There were a lot of banking-ish people. Do people want to do finance? Sure. Sure, why not finance? Okay, finance. Finance stuff. Finance stuff. Adolescence. Adolescence, okay. Adolescence. Adolescence. Any other target groups, target technologies, target sectors tourism low income new hampshire right? low income new hampshireites <laughs> no income new hamp any others no students students okay students is good students any other spaces you want to think about uh, is there any interest in tourism is there any interest in health those are some other big sectors no Education. Pardon? Mental health, mental health. Ooh, I like that. Mental health. Mental health. That's a good one. Huge opportunities in all of these. Mental health. Any others? No. Toys. People like toys. Anyone want to make a new toy? No? Raise your if you like toys. Toys! Yay! Theo likes toys. Okay, toys. <laughs> toys. We'll try toys. Uh, any others? No? All right. So we have eight things. I was going to say seven and eight. Eight different things. So we should cut off one or two others. Uh, we could take, we could mer merge a few. How about if we take adolescence and toys together? Does that sound good? Toys and adolescence. And I'll leave that group uh, to decide exactly what that means, what, count, what constitutes an adolescent. 
Uh, so now we're down to seven. We have to get rid of one more if we want one per table. You can take prisoners out. What? I love prisoners. I know, me too. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, well, we could also vote to see who wants what. Put finance and low income together. Oh, that's a good idea. OK. All right, we'll take those two together. So let's just put them in order. So if you're interested in third world communities, we'll go here. I guess we'll go down the back. So third world communities is here. Prisoners is there. Uh, Financy stuff is at the back on the left. What does finance mean, actually, apart from just money? Uh, well, we have MBA people. <laughs> I mean, it could be anything. It could be uh, you know, ways of doing banking online, on your phone. How could banks appeal to people? How could you get people educated more about finance, making financial decisions? There's you know, just money stuff, if that makes money it. Stuff, okay. Money stuff. Money <laughs> stuff. All right, so, the mon so money stuff is at the back over there. Uh, I guess then we'll go to students at the back over there, and we'll come back up. Mental health is you guys. Middle table there is mental health, and toys is up front. Does that make sense? Does everyone know? <laughs> Third world communities is here. Prisoners is there. Finance stuff is at the back. Uh, you are students at that table there, and then mental health and toys. All right. So third world is up here. Prisoners is on the left in the middle. The far back is finance stuff. The far back right, my right, is uh, student stuff. The middle on my right is mental health, and the front here is toys. <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Ooh, not a lot of time. All right. That's good, though. That's great. All right. So I'm going to begin with showing you just part of one more video. It's kind of a nice one. And this is now where we have to start digging into the customers, understanding our customers. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. I guess we only have about 25 minutes or so, if even 20 minutes, something like that. So we're going to just get started on the customer side of things. Uh, but I wanted to begin with just a little video and I'm going to stop it partway through because he kind of goes on a bit later. But this is uh, uh, one of the main designers at IDEO talking about a big project they did in healthcare, redesigning hospitals and things. Uh, and I'm going to actually probably skip the first few seconds as well because it's a bit, well, maybe I won't. Where is my mouse? There. The ah, perfect. Person. And how do you bring those two things together? Charlie Ledbetter yesterday, I thought, talked very articulately about this need to bring consumers, to bring people into the process of creating things. And, and that's what I want to talk about today. So bringing together the small to help facilitate and create the big, I think is something that we believe in, something I believe in, and something that we kind of bring to life through what we do at IDEO. I call this first chapter for the Brits in the room, the blinding glimpse of the bleeding obvious. Often the good ideas are so staring at you right in the face that you kind of miss them. And I think a lot of times what we do is just sort of hold the mirror up to our clients and sort of go, duh, you know, look what's really going on. And rather than talk about it in the theory, I think I'm just gonna show you an example. We were asked by a large healthcare system in Minnesota to describe to them what their patient experience was. And I think they were expecting, they've worked with lots of consultants before, I think they were expecting some kind of hideous org chart with thousands of bubbles and systemic this, that, and the other, and all kinds of mind mappy stuff. Or even worse, some kind of ghastly death by PowerPoint thing with wow charts and all kinds of, you know, God knows whatever. Um, the first thing we actually shared with them was, was this. I'll play this until your eyeballs completely dissolve. This is 59 seconds into the film. This is a minute 59. Three minutes 19. I think something happens. I think a head may appear in a second. Five minutes 10. Five minutes 58. Six minutes 20. We showed them the whole cut and they were all completely what what is this and the point is when you lie in a hospital bed all day all you do is look at the roof 
and it's a really shitty experience. <laughs> and just putting yourself in the position of the patient, this is Christian who works with us at IDEO, he just lay in the hospital bed and kind of stared at the polystyrene ceiling tiles for a really long time. That's what it's like to be a patient in the hospital. And they were sort of, you know, blinding glimpse of bleeding obvious, oh my goodness. So looking at the situation from the point of view of the person out, as opposed to the traditional position of the organization in, was for these guys quite a revelation. And so that was a really catalytic thing for them. So they snapped into action. They said, OK, it's not about systemic change. It's not about huge, ridiculous things that we need to do. It's about tiny things that can make a huge amount of difference. So we started with them prototyping some really little things that we could do to have a huge amount of impact. The first thing we did was we took a little bicycle mirror and we band-aided it here onto a gurney, a hospital trolley, so that when you were wheeled around by a nurse or by a doctor, you could actually have a conversation with them. You could kind of see them in your rearview mirror. So it created a tiny human interaction, a really small example of something that they could do. Interestingly, the nurses themselves sort of snapped into action, said, OK, we kind of we embrace this. What can we do? The first thing they did was they decorated the ceiling. So I thought it was really, I showed this to my mother recently. I think my mother now thinks that I'm some sort of interior decorator. That's what I do for a living. Sort of Lawrence Llewell and Bowen. Not particularly the world's best design solution for those of us who are real sort of hardcore designers, but nonetheless, a fabulous empathic solution for people. Things that they started doing themselves, like changing the floor going into the patient's room so that it signified this is my room, this is my personal space, was a really interesting sort of design solution to the problem. So you went from public space to private space. And another idea, again, that came from one of the nurses, which I love, was they took traditional sort of corporate whiteboards and they put them on one wall of the patient's room where they put this sticker there. So that what you could actually do was go into the room and write messages to the person who was sick in that room which is lovely, so tiny, tiny, tiny solutions that made a huge amount of impact. And I thought that was a really, really nice example. So this is not particularly a new idea, kind of seeing opportunities in things that are around you and kind of snapping and turning them into a solution. There's a history of invention based around this. I'm going to read this because I want to get these names right. Joan Gantz Cooney saw her daughter, came down on a Saturday morning, saw her daughter watching the test card, waiting for programs to come on one morning. And from that came Sesame Street. Malcolm McLean was moving from one country to another and was wondering why it took these guys so long to get the boxes onto the ship. And he invented the shipping container. George de Mistral, this is not bugs all over at Birkenstock, um, was walking with his dog in a field and got covered in burrs, sort of little prickly things. And from that came Velcro. And finally, for the Brits, Percy Shaw, this is a bit of a big British invention, saw the cat's eyes at the side of the road when he was driving home one night. And from that came the cat's eye. So there's a whole series of just using your eyes, seeing things for the first time, seeing things afresh, and using that as an opportunity to create new possibilities. So, nice examples, right? And the patient one in particular is really about understanding who your customer is. In that sense, it's patients in a hospital, and the only way to really know what their experiences are like if you're going to craft a new design solution is to kind of get in their space and understand how they live their life. And that's really what the customer side of things is about, identifying a very specific customer that you want to try to appeal to. So that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time on now before we have to break. Uh, and, and I just wanted to show you a few other examples of how you can actually come up with some new insights just by understanding your customer. This is one from a very different world, uh, Baby Food. One of my old master's students was part of this. Uh, it's quite interesting. So if you look at how people always used baby food, it basically used to always come in these little glass jars and you open it up and you kind of feed the baby. And it was pretty messy because you needed a spoon, you needed the glass jar. At the end of the time you were stuck because you had this empty glass jar. It was kind of heavy if you wanted to carry it around in your bag or purse or whatever. If you had a few of them, they got really heavy, they would break. Uh, and so these kinds of simple insights into how uh, parents live with their little baby led to the development of this. This was the first kind of uh, foilized baby food individually wrapped and it's, it's very clever because it's just a kind of aluminum foil kind of thing. You just twist off the top and you squeeze it right into the baby's mouth and you're all done. You don't need a spoon, you just at the end have this light thing you can just throw out. And it's 
a great innovation, a great invention, and, and it really was just purely based on design thinking. The guy who came up with this spent a lot of time, he knew he wanted to do something in the food space, maybe in the baby food space, and he spent weeks and months uh, interviewing moms, just going around, oh, what's the biggest pain in this feeding process, etc. And he identified all these nice little opportunities. Uh, he also created this gorgeous website and brand. He sort of created this world that was all about being a better parent. So there's, there's other aspects of design thinking kind of behind the scene there. And in the end, it became the best selling baby food in the UK. It was bought by I forget, Gerber, I think, some US food, baby food giant. <laughs> giant. Uh, it became a huge company. Pardon? How many students have to leave at two? Lots do. This actually will work out pretty well. Yeah. Uh, that, no, that's, I think it, we're going to be right on time. So, uh, oh, banking, that shouldn't say, oh yeah, no, this is banking. I'm saying banking customers. I just want to show you one other little example. Uh, this is a, a Barclays Bank in the UK. They did, uh, they did all kinds of interesting stuff, but again, a lot of it is led from design thinking. They're actually, even though it sounds like a staid British bank, they're actually pretty innovative. They were the first ATMs in the UK, first credit cards in the UK. They sort of have been out there at the forefront of new innovations in banking. Uh, and they, they, they actually acknowledge the idea that design thinking is core and they even have a whole team, they have a design director, et cetera, who are out there doing design thinking to understand how their customers want to spend their money, their time, what experiences they want. And they're using all of that to craft new finance solutions. And so they realize that customers have these kinds of problems, paying bills, transferring money from like your, your uh, checking account to a savings account or from a savings account to an IRA. I don't even know anything about money, but paying friends, all of these things were problems. And so they actually decided to take those insights and create a new app. Um, and I'll just quickly show you an example of their app. This is the thing they developed called Ping It. I think this is a movie. Hmm. Oh, no, the next one's a movie. There we go. Here's, here's the little ad showing the features that they developed. I don't know why my mouse has disappeared, but let's try it this way. Just one second. <laughs> ah, there's the mouse. All right, I'll play and then full screen. Let's see if that works. Is that going to work? Not at all. Ah, my mouse is back though, yay. Sometimes paying back money can be a real hassle. That's why Barclays has a new free mobile app that lets you send money with just your mobile phone. All you need is someone's mobile number and you can use it whether you bank with Barclays or not. She's sending her mate 12 quid for her share of the curry last Friday. Seems a bit steep, she only had a few poppadons. And he is just paying off his friend Terry 20 pounds for a cab. What a night out that was. There goes 100 quid to his son for university books. I know his son, he ain't spending on books. Barclays Ping It, the easy way to send money using just a mobile number. So simple ad, simple concept, but it really worked well. They, their main design goals were to make something that's very easy, which just works. An app that could be shared on social media. So if you wanted to send me money on Facebook, you could send me a link that would actually uh, allow me to automatically download this app and start receiving your money. Uh, it's a pretty cool idea. And I'm just going to show you one other aspect of it, which is also pretty innovative. Another ad that they ran targeting a different demographic. Jane has just started using Barclays Ping It on her smartphone and tablet. She's always busy, so she's delighted with the flexibility and speed it gives her when managing her payments. Jane had some cash left over from her salary this month, and after receiving a reminder email from her ISA provider, she decided to maximize her annual ISA entitlement. She used Barclays Ping It to pay the cash into her ISA before she forgot. She scanned the QR code directly from the email using her Barclays Ping It app. She entered the amount she wanted to transfer, checked the details and pressed send. The transfer was immediate, without the hassle of checks or paper forms. The company easily reconciled the payment and Jane received a text straight away confirming that the funds had credited her ISA account. Jane is so impressed with how easy it was to manage her ISA with Invest Direct that she will be telling her friends about it, especially as they can all download and use Barclays Ping It, even if they aren't a Barclays customer. With Barclays Ping It, your customers can transact in a number of ways, including paying bills, buying products, receiving funds, and donating to charities, all by using an app on their phone. Click, scan, review, pay. 
pretty clever, pretty uh, nice little app, simple, does a lot of things, and even the ad campaigns themselves have been kind of designed through design thinking. And this, the results are very successful. You know, in the first five days, they had 120,000 downloads, which for a tiny country like the UK is insane. It's like half the people. No, no. Uh, and it did really well. Uh, and in fact, if you look at who uses the app again, they were kind of surprised. They had intended it to be mostly millennials. That's the gold goal of all financial institutions right now is to capture this millennial market, but even, you know, 50 and above people were using it. 30% of their customers, 50 and above, downloaded the app, which is pretty cool. So, right now, and in the next seven minutes, we have to think about who are your customers. So, for instance, third world communities, that's this group, or prisoners. So, you need to start thinking about who are your customers. And so, I'm going to skip this slide because these are sort of possible customers to get think, people thinking, but we already have some identified. I also wanted to mention that sometimes I've used design thinking for internal organization change, and there too it might be your customers are different people in the company. So you can actually use design thinking to reorganize how a company works, which is kind of a fun other thing. We'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, so in this case, you need to think about who your customers are. And I, I guess since everyone's having to leave in five minutes, uh, usually what I would do is I would send you out and go and try, and, and maybe you could in your classes and stuff. If you could find someone in your class who's a prisoner, <laughs> go and talk to them. Uh, spend some time if you can. I know you all are busy and have classes to go off to, but spend some time while you're out there trying to think about who are these customers that you're going to have to come up with an idea for. You're going to design something for, you know, toys and adolescents. So come up with some words. What are the, for instance, things to think about? What are the uh, dreams of these people? What are their fears? What are their aspirations? What would, what's the best thing that could happen to them? What's the worst thing that could happen to them? How do they spend their time? If you can come up with some uh, examples of how they spend their time. So if it's kids, you know, they spend a lot of time watching TV, playing video games, maybe doing homework in the evenings, you know, come up with some major activities that they do throughout their day. Because often there's opportunities to design thinking, to apply design thinking to come up with something to make those activities better. So spend the next time while you're gone, because we only have six minutes now, so after you go away, spend some time thinking about what are those people like. And I think I'm going to skip ahead. I had some millennial stuff, but it'll skip. Here we go. So uh, I want you to, ideally, what we're going to do when you get back is come up with personas. So like maybe it is student Susan. She spends her evenings reading. These are her fears. These are her dreams. These are her aspirations. Uh, oops, sorry. That's the slide I wanted. Uh, what are they like? How do they spend their time and money? Why would they want whatever it is you're going to create? What are their kind of demographics? What age range are they in? What are their psychographics? How do they like spend their time? What activities? What sports? Uh, what are their dreams, pains, and lifestyles? And are there any natural segmentation? So for the toys group, maybe you want to think about, well, there's the tech kind of kids and there's the low tech, high tech and low tech, for instance. So think about those things. Uh, over the next time and when you come back this evening, I guess, we'll have some more good food and we'll really kind of keep going. We've made it now through the intro and customer. If you can crack this, you'll be a long way along. So try to think about really who is your customer like. All right, and I hope to see you all at 5.30. Is that right, 5.30? Yeah, right at 5.30 so you can come early anytime. It'll be here. You just get the scan for IT Passport and uh, back up here. Cool. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, thanks. <laughs>